Okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry about the technical issues this morning. Off we go. I have a sick family member at home, so masking on. Can everyone still hear me in the back okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. So, as promised, Tuesday morning, just a little bit of a refresher of where we are and where we're going with the assignments. Uh, undergraduates, you're working your way through uh, empty simulation objects, which are known as links in the Pi Bullet simulator that we're using. And you're moving on today in assignment three to joints, like your elbow joint or your knee joint, the things that connect objects or links together. So far, you've had a relatively easy go of it because everything you've been coding up in the assignments has a visual counterpart. So when you installed PyroSim, uh, when you installed uh, PyBullet and PyroSim at the beginning uh, of the assignments and you got the simulator working, you'd see a window opening. In assignment two, when you were creating links and you added a link, if you mixed up length and width and height, you would see it immediately in the block itself. So everything you were coding up had a visual counterpart. From joints onward, everything you're going to be adding to your uh, code base is invisible. It's not going to have a visual counterpart in the virtual world. The things that you're adding, like joints in assignment three, they are going to affect the physics in your virtual world, but they're going to affect things indirectly because you won't see, for example, the joints themselves. So the first thing I want to advise you about in assignment three is to train yourself in being able to diagnose what goes wrong in your simulator as you start to add these invisible elements. You're gonna be adding joints in assignment three. In assignment four, you're gonna be adding sensors, then motors, then neurons, then synapses, none of which have a visual component. So how do you know whether you've implemented the joint, the sensor, the motor, the neuron, or the synapse correctly? You're gonna to have to build up an intuition for when those things are having the effect you want on the virtual world and when they're not. So I wanna take three minutes now and just talk about how to do this for joints. As I mentioned, joints like my elbow joint are going to connect together neighboring links in your uh, physical simulation. There are a number of properties that you need to set for each individual joint. The first one is the position of the joint itself. Where in three-dimensional space is that joint? It's kind of intuitive. The 3D position of that joint should be exactly where the two links come together. That's where you want to connect those pieces together. If you get that 3D position correctly and you start dragging pairs of connected links, you should see each link rotating relative to the other one at exactly the point where they touch. Make sense? Okay. If you get the position wrong, you put the joint up here, and luckily I cannot demonstrate this for you with my upper and lower arm. If the joint's position is up here, the two links are gonna rotate about this position. So if you add a link to your, if you add a joint to your simulation and when you start to simulate it in the first time step of the simulation the objects or the links seem to be correct but then they start to move away from one another in weird non-physical ways that's the indirect signal to you that you've got something wrong in terms of joint position make sense that's, of course, also what the TA and I are looking for when we're grading your assignments. If you submit your links, uh, your joints assignment, and we see pairs of links coming apart, we'll deduct a point because we know you've got the position of the joint wrong. So far, so good? Okay. A couple other points about links that are uh, particularly confusing. So I want you to pay attention to this as you're implementing assignment three. There are a number of features uh, or settings for a given joint, like position, which we just talked about. There's another feature of a joint which is gonna be set for you by PyroSim. You're not gonna have to do it yet, 
But I want to just mention it now because this could be a little bit confusing now and later on. When you're setting the position of a joint, you obviously have to supply three numbers because we're working in three dimensions. You're, you're supplying the three-dimensional position of the joint. For now, PyroSim, whenever you create a joint, is also going to send three additional numbers to the physics engine, which is known as the joint's normal. So let's go back to the example of my upper arm and lower arm. Those additional three numbers, the joint's normal, are going to represent a vector in three-dimensional space. That vector is going to dictate the plane, the two-dimensional plane, through which the pair of connected links rotates. Make sense? So if I've set my elbow joint to be here, telling the physics engine that I want this object to rotate relative to this object about this point, if I define this particular joint normal, pointing towards you, there is one and only one two-dimensional plane that is normal to this 3D vector. Everybody remember high school algebra? Yeah? Okay. So I'm telling the physics engine that I want these two parts to rotate in this way. If I do exactly the same thing, I connect these two links together with the joint, I give the exact same position of the joint, but now I define this joint normal, how is my upper arm going to rotate relative to my lower arm? Exactly, right? There is one and only one two-dimensional plane that is normal to this 3D vertical vector, the 2D plane. At the moment, PyroSim is going to set the normal for you. It's going to set it to, well, I can't, uh, you, you'll see it when it's set up. Uh, later on in the course, you can change the joint normal so you can alter how the two objects rotate relative to one another. Question? Kind of unrelated to the joint stuff. Is yep. Padlet is just like pretty slow. Like I noticed uh, even just building like the, the cubes, like on what's like, I bought my laptop like last year. It took okay. like considerable amount of time. Okay, good question. So is PyBullet slow? If you're running it on a laptop from last year, it absolutely should not be. What might be slow is the graphics, right? You see it building these towers. Yeah. And then once you've built the towers and you start to grab an object and throw it around, assuming you have a relatively recent laptop, that should go quickly. If it's not, something's probably wrong. Come and see the TA or myself. What we're going to do later in this course, when you start wrapping your evolutionary algorithm around the physics engine, and it's going to try out hundreds or thousands of millions of robots in your virtual world, you're going to be running many, 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 many simulations on your laptop. At that point, we're going to turn off the graphics. Once you turn off the graphics, the physics will go, should go very fast. Okay, question. Uh, okay, so good point for on some platforms. Maybe it's the IDE like spider that's actually slowing things down Again for the upper years here and especially for the grad students If you haven't had a chance to work directly at the command line or the terminal before here's a great opportunity to learn how to do things Strip away all unnecessary machinery like IDEs My recommendation any other questions tips or tricks? If things are running slow for now, it doesn't matter, but it will matter once we start doing some optimization. Yeah? Okay, third and final thing I want to say about joints, just as a heads up for you to spend some time thinking about. In Pi, uh, question, yep? Um, I was wondering if it's important that the joints are always like originating from the central body, or if they can originate from anywhere because they're just in uh, is there like a swivel or like, well not a swivel, like an axle? Okay, I think there's a couple questions embedded in that question. One thing to point out is there are different kinds of joints that you can implement in PyBull. It supports different kinds of joints. For the moment, you're only going to be working with rotational joints, things that cause pairs of connected links to rotate relative to one another. You can also create uh, linear joints in PyBullet. 
which acts like a piston. It allows pairs of connected links to move away from one another and towards one another. Different kinds of joints. We're only going to work with rotational joints at the moment. Your second question is about where do the joints originate? And that's a good question, so I'm going to try and answer that right now. So we just talked about two important features of joints. The position of the joint, the joint's normal. Last thing to pay attention to, uh, especially in assignment three, is relative and absolute coordinates. So up till now, when you're dealing with uh, links, you're using absolute coordinates. Somewhere in your virtual world, there is the position 0, 0, 0, the world origin. And when you identify, when you supply a, 3D, a set of 3D coordinates for where a link should be or where a joint should be, you're dealing with absolute coordinates. It's at this position in the absolute, in, in the world. As you start to connect together multiple pairs uh, of links with joints, some of those joints, you're going to start using relative coordinates to define them. So continuing to use my body as an example here, I've got my uh, upper body here, and my upper body is connected to my upper arm with a shoulder joint. My upper arm is collected, connected to my lower arm with my, uh, with, at my elbow joint. The first joint you're going to define, you're going to use absolute coordinates. But as you continue down the body of the robot, you're going to switch from using absolute to relative coordinates. You're going to give the position of this joint relative to the position of uh, one of the links. That's relative, relative as in the position is relative to something else you've already added to your simulation. It's a little confusing. I tried to make a little Google uh, slide show there to help explain it. Take, take some time to make sure you really digest and understand absolute and relative coordinates. You'll know if you've got it wrong in the simulation because the objects will start to separate from one another. So hopefully it's relatively easy to identify when things are wrong, work back, make sure you have this all clear in your head. On um, the object that's defined in the joint definition, the one that, like the, the child's object that's okay. connected to the parent joint, is that the only one that has um, relative absolute coordinates, or is it every single link after the joint definition? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't remember off the top of my head. It should all be explained in assignment three. All right. It's all there. OK. OK, why would a physics engine add this twist of complication? Why not define the positions of every link and every joint in absolute coordinates? Seems much simpler. Why mix and match absolute and relative coordinates? Anybody have an idea? Um, just because if, if you're building more complex structures and like like it could be very hard to say like I'm trying to make even like a hand a stamp like this it could be really hard to figure out where these like those points are in absolute space whereas you know if you know the angle and like the width of this joint it's pretty easy to define it relative to a previous one. Absolutely. If you start, you're not going to yet in this class, but if you start to build very complex robots made up of many, many parts, it gets a little bit easier to define the positions of things relative to what you said, parent parts. Pa parent meaning up towards the center of the body of the robot. Child meaning down towards the tips of fingers and toes and legs and so on. Another reason why is that PyBullet tries to make it relatively easy for you to build a complex multi-link object like a robot and then make exactly the same thing but a different position in the virtual world. If everything, if the, uh, if the parent node, the thing at the top, is defined in absolute coordinates and you make a new one, you define those different absolute coordinates but then all the other coordinates in that second robot, because they're all relative positions, stay the same. Yeah, it makes it easier to make a complex thing and then clone it throughout the simulator. 
That's why Pyrosim is going to put you through this torture session of learning when and where to use relative and absolute coordinates. For those of you that are going to make robot swarms later in this course, it's worth the time and effort and pain. All good? Okay. I think that's all I've got to say about links and joints for today. Graduate students, you're running ahead to neurons and synapses this week. Motors and neurons and synapses, I think. Okay, back to our lecture material. Okay, apologies for speeding through embodied cognition. Last time, hopefully this concept is relatively clear. We're going to see lots of examples of robots as we continue through this course that exploit the fact that they are embodied in the world to pull out of the world the information they learn, they need to learn about their relationship with the world and survive and thrive in that world. We will also see robots that exploit their situated nature, the fact that they are continuously bring it, uh, pulling in sensory information in real time. We are now going to move on to the second theme of this course, which is the nuts and bolts of evolutionary robotics or the tools of the trade. We just spent a few minutes talking about some of the intricacies of physical simulation. We'll come back to that uh, probably next week. Okay. Today, however, we're going to talk, we're going to start by talking about the brains that are going to make up your robots, which are artificial neural networks. Okay. A pretty hot topic at the moment. A lot of what we're going to see today forms the engine room of ChatGPT and stable diffusion and all the other fancy AI models that are out there. For some of you, this is going to be very uh, remedial. A lot of you will have seen this before, but some of you are not going to have seen some of this material before, so please bear with me today. Okay. We're going to start, as is appropriate for this course, we're going to start with robots. Which robots are these? We've seen these already. Uh, the Bradenburg vehicles. These are the Bradenburg vehicles, right? So we've got two sensors on the front of the robot, in this case, photo sensors, two motorized wheels on the back. And as we saw last week, we can connect the two sensors to the two motors in different ways. We can connect them ipsilaterally, same side sensor to same side motor, or contralaterally, this sensor to this motor. We could connect this sensor to this motor and this sensor to this motor. There's different ways we could wire up the sensors to the motors. Okay, let's, a terrible thing to do in a robotics class, we're going to take the body and throw the body away for a moment and keep the, the brain. We talked about Cartesian dualism last uh, a few weeks ago. Bear with me, this is a little bit Cartesian, but it'll help us understand neural networks. So with a Breitenberg vehicle fresh in your mind, imagine this non-embodied Breitenberg vehicle. The only thing we've kept are the two sensors and the two motors back here. We're going to start to introduce some terminology here. We're going to assume that these two circles in the top are actually sensor neurons. So this is a simulation of a neuron. Sensor neurons, the only thing they're going to do is collect numbers from the sensors. So we've got the sensors themselves. The sensors are connected to sensor neurons, and as we're going to see throughout this morning's lecture, neurons hold a value inside themselves. They're called neurons. Um, they're a very gross approximation of how actual biological neurons work. We're going to strip away most of the details about biological neurons, and we're only going to add back those biological details as we need them for squeezing useful behavior out of our robots. For now, the only thing neurons are, are are buckets. They're collecting numbers from the sensors. We're going to assume that neurons are connected together with synapses, so all the arrows you see are going to be things that connect pairs of neurons together. Here's a synapse represented by an arrow. Each synapse has a presynaptic neuron. and a post 
synaptic neuron. As the name implies, if we're talking about any given synapse, the presynaptic neuron is the one at the base of the synapse. The postsynaptic neuron is the neuron at the head of the synapse. We're going to assume these synapses are very, very simple. The only thing these synapses are going to do is take the value from their presynaptic neuron and pass it on to their postsynaptic neuron. Pretty simple so far. Biological synapses, again, are horrendously complicated structures. For now, we're going to focus on the basic thing they do, which is act as wires or transmission wires. They pass along signals from pre to post synaptic neurons. So far, so good. Nothing too crazy here yet. OK. All right, so we've got our two sensor neurons up here. We've got two neuro neurons down here at the output layer. We're going to treat these two sensors as motor neurons. Like the sensor neurons, the only thing the motor neurons are going to do is to take their value and send it to the motor. The motor, which is not drawn here, the motor is the thing that's going to control the wheel. The only thing that a motor does is to interpret this number as a command. If a motor is spinning a wheel, the motor might interpret this number as a desired velocity. How fast should the motor try and get the wheel to turn? So motor neurons send commands to motors. So far, so good? OK. From the robot's point of view, the sensors capture information from out in the world, pass those values on to their sensor neurons. The synapses flow or propagate those values from their pre to their postsynaptic neurons. The values arriving at the motor neurons are sent to the motors. The motors apply torque. Torque is rotational force. How much to torque or twist the wheel? And the wheel spins. Sense, think, act. You'll hear this over and over again when we talk about robotics. OK, pretty simple so far. Let's start to add in some neural complexity to our, uh, our disembodied robot here. We're going to change the neural architecture. We mentioned this term a few weeks ago. Neural architecture, it describes the number of neurons, how they're arranged, which neurons are connected by synapses. So we're making a change to the neural architecture of this neural network by adding two additional synapses. And we're going to add a little bit of complexity to how our motor neurons behave. From this simple cartoon, you should be able to guess what is the added complexity we're adding to our motor neurons. What do they do now that they weren't, they didn't have to do before? Add. That's it, right? So this particular neuron has two arriving synapses. At every point in time, this motor neuron is collecting the values, or is collecting the values that are incoming from all of its incoming synapses. We've added in one of the very important features of biological neurons. Biological neurons collect information from other neurons that are sending values to them along the incoming synapses. The only thing these motor neurons are doing is summing these values. If we were to take this particular neural architecture and put it back in the Breitenberg vehicle, what kind of behavior would this neural network cause the vehicle to exhibit? It would just drive, it would always drive straight. Why would it always drive straight? Um, because the, uh, Absolutely. We've got some inbuilt symmetry here, right? The left hand motor neuron is always doing exactly the same thing as the right hand motor neuron. They're both doing exactly the same thing, which means they always get exactly the same values, which means they're always applying the same amount of torque to the wheels, which means the vehicle always. Um, I was also going to say that things would go faster, the closer like the angle is towards like the 
the light source. Ah, okay. So it's always going to go straight. So you're answering my next question, anticipating my next question, which is, tell me about the velocity of the robot. We know about its direction. Its direction never changes. It always goes straight. What about velocity? The velocity would decrease because the light isn't head on. If the, well, we're assuming that this is from this example. It seems yep. like it sure. is from the arrows. Um, but since the numbers are not the same on each side, that means that it's hitting it from an angle. So that means that at some point it would pass that angle. OK. And what happens, let's, let's do this example. We've got the flashlight front left of the robot. We know that the robot always grows straight. So it's going to obliquely approach the light. The light is going to generally get closer to the body of the robot and then pass by. What happens? Um, as it gets closer, like the input value goes up, so it'll go faster. So if it's slow, then it's fast, faster, and so that's why. Absolutely. So if the light is front left of the robot and the robot moves forward, now the light is a little bit closer. There is still a difference in the two input values, the two values at the sensor neurons, but their sum is greater. There's just more light falling on both sensors. So the robot speeds up, goes past the light, and the light starts to fade behind the robot. What does the robot do as the light starts to fade into the background behind it? It slows down. OK. So the purpose of our little back and forth here is just to remind you that the choices we make about the neural network inside the robot, changes to the neural architecture like we just saw, influences how the robot behaves in its environment. That's the whole game we're going to play in this course. If we want the robot to do something useful, what is the right neural network controller that will cause the robot to do that? So far, so good? OK. So we've got neurons now that are summing their inputs. <laughs> Let's assume this hypothetical example uh, over here. We're going to now fold in yet another biological detail, which is we're going to start to assign floating point numbers to the synapses. And these floating point numbers are known as weights. Why are they called weights? The larger the number is, sorry, the greater the magnitude of the number, the more negative or the more positive that number is, the greater the weight of influence that synapse has on its postsynaptic neuron. This is, again, a biological detail of synapses. Some synapses pass along the signal from their pre to their postsynaptic neuron, but they weaken the signal as they pass it along. They have a decrease, they decrease the weight of influence of their presynaptic neuron on their postsynaptic neuron. This biological detail is incorporated into artificial neural networks by assigning these numbers. And then every time we're calculating the value at a postsynaptic neuron, we take that neuron, we look at all of the incoming synapses, we take for each synapse, we take the value of its presynaptic neuron, we multiply it by the weight of that synapse, add it to the value of this postsynaptic neuron, go to the next incoming synapse for this particular neuron, multiply that synapse's presynaptic neuron's value by that synapse's weight, and add it to this growing sum at the postsynaptic neuron. Yeah. So how did we get 1.29 here? 0.6 times 0.8 plus 0.9 times 0.9. So far, so good? OK. This is the magic formula, the main thing that underlies all chat GPTs, stable diffusions. Everything is built on top of this basic idea. In ChatGPT and stable diffusion, you have a gazillion of these neurons wired up in horrendously intricate, intricate ways. What do each of those little neurons inside ChatGPT do? This times this plus this times this. That's it. Well, that's not, not just it, but most of what these neurons do. So far, so good? Okay.
All right, so, uh, so that's synaptic weights. Let's add in one additional detail known as activation functions. And this name comes again from biological neurons, which we'll get to in a moment. Let's back up a moment. In this hypothetical example, we can see that the two motor neurons receive these two values. Imagine that the left-hand motor over here says, excuse me, I have a problem. You're telling me to rotate you're telling me to apply rotational force or torque to the wheel at 1.29, whatever the units are for torque, doesn't matter for our purposes. I'm a relatively weak motor. I can only apply torque up to 1.0, nothing above. You're asking me to do the impossible. I can't torque the wheel that strongly. A lot of neurons, what we're going to try and do is cap the raw sum that we're calculating inside that neuron, we're gonna try and cap it within a reasonable range. What do we mean by a reasonable range? In our case, where the neural networks are going to control the motors that make up our robot, we're gonna try and cap that range to the values that those motors can apply. Not, not, too, not above, not below. So far, so good? So we're gonna, again, add a little bit of detail or complication to how we simulate these neurons. After each neuron computes its raw weighted sum, we're gonna pass that raw sum, which in this case is 1.29 for this neuron. We're gonna pass it through an activation number, which is gonna take those raw values, whatever those raw values are, and ensure that it squashes them within a reasonable range. In uh, artificial neural networks, there are a lot of different kinds of activation functions that are used. The simplest is the identity function, which doesn't do any squashing at all. You just take the raw value and, supply, and return it as the output of that neuron. That's not gonna work for our purposes because our motors can't do everything we ask them to do. We might use the step function where if you think of the horizontal axis here, the x representing the raw sum, if that raw sum is greater than zero, x is greater than zero, return from that neuron a value of 1.0. If the raw sum arriving at that neuron is less than zero, x is less than zero, return a value of minus one, for example. If we were to take this step function and use this step function as the activation function for these neurons, and then we took this neural network and put it back inside the Breitenberg vehicle, how does this step function affect the way the vehicle moves? Uh, that's part of the answer, yeah. It would either be moving as fast as it can, right? So the neurons are either receive the, the neurons are either spitting out plus one, which means rotate the wheels as fast as possible forward, or the motor neurons are outputting a minus one reverse, reverse as fast as possible. If you dropped this neural network with step activation functions into a Breitenberg vehicle, you'd see it do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. It would always either be racing forward or racing backwards. We've again made a change to the neural network controller of the robot, and we can see there is a change to the robot's behavior. And wouldn't it going backwards require that the sensors have like a negative light value? Okay, great point question. In order for it to go backwards, meaning that the motor neurons are gonna have to receive or be able to receive a negative number, don't the sensors have to register negative values? Before we answer that question, remember that in our cartoon example here, these two sensor neurons are receiving values from two photosensors, which are registering the amount of light in the environment. Can light sensors register negative values? There's no such thing, right? So this, the, sensor, the sensor neurons are only ever going to receive positive values or maybe zero if it's pitch black. How do we get negative numbers at the output layer? Negative weight 
negative weights. You'll notice that one of these four synaptic weights has a negative value associated with it. Thank you for asking that question. That was one additional biological detail that I was about to miss. Yeah. What does it mean for a synapse to have a negative weight? Is it inhibitory? It's inhibitory. So synapses can be either inhibitory or excitatory. So an inhibitory neuron is uh, an in inhibitory synapse is simulated by giving that synapse a negative weight. You can see how an inhibitory synapse works by looking at this particular synapse here. Remember that we're always going to multiply this synapse's presynaptic neuron's value by its weight. If this value is very low, meaning this sensor is registering low light values, we've got a value near zero being multiplied by a negative number, which means we are subtracting a small amount from this growing sum. Everybody see that? As the vehicle keeps moving towards, for example, a light source, this value is going to start to increase in magnitude. What starts to happen in how this synapse influences its postsynaptic neuron? This value is increasing in magnitude. The weight doesn't change. It stays minus 0.3. What's happening? The output is going to go down. The higher magnitude multiplied by this negative number means we are subtracting more from this output neuron. The inhibitory synapse is inhibiting its postsynaptic neuron by a greater amount. Yeah? Gosh forbid this happens to any of you over the next hour. You start to realize you might need to visit the men's or ladies' rooms after this lecture finishes. As this lecture continues, that need grows greater. Assuming you want to stay and listen to the rest of the lecture, you're going, your brain is going to have to increasingly inhibit your motivation to go visit the men's or ladies' room. Yeah, This happens all the time. Lots of interesting neural science, even at this point in our discussion. It seems like uh, neuroscience is discovering that most of the connections in our brain are inhibitory. The, pre, the stronger the presynaptic neuron's value is, the more that inhibitory synapse inhibits the firing or the activity of its postsynaptic neuron. Excitatory, that's all the positive weights. The stronger the magnitude of the presynaptic neuron, the more it adds to this growing sum rather than subtracts from it. So far, so good? OK. Lots of different kinds of activation functions we can choose. The, uh, in the early days of the deep learning revolution, there were papers being published about new kinds of activation functions were uh, claiming this is the best activation function. You put this in your early chat GPT, and it'll do way better. You can imagine what happened a few months later. Somebody else published a paper saying, no, 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 no. This activation is the best one. OK. This is not a class in artificial neural networks. We're not going to discuss the pros and cons of different activation functions. The assignments will instruct you to drop in a particular kind of activation function, and off we go. So far, so good? OK, let's push on. OK. What do neural networks do? In this class, the neural network is going to control the robot. How does the neural network control the robot? By acting as a function. A neural network is really just a mathematical object that represents a function that transforms its inputs into a value or values arriving at that network or function's output. Yeah? OK, so let's have a look about, at how neural networks actually act as a function. We're going to simplify things greatly here. We're going to assume we have just two input neurons. 
I'm going to use input neurons synonymously with sensor neurons in this class. When I say input neurons, that's kind of a hint that we're going to just focus on non-embodied stuff for a little bit. We're going to ignore the body of the robot. When I say output neurons, same thing. Output neurons are synonymous with motor neurons. When I say output, we're assuming we're not really thinking about the robot in which the neural network is placed. Okay, as you can see, the particular neural architecture for this simple neural network, it's got two input neurons, one output neuron, two synapses. We're going to further simplify things where we are going to apply values. We're going to plug values into the two input neurons, and we're going to see what values we get at the output. We're going to use, uh, we're going to use a step activation function at the single output neuron. If the raw sum that, arise, that arrives down here is less than some threshold, we, we're going to set in a moment what that threshold is. If that raw weighted sum is below this threshold, we're going to set the output neuron to zero. If the raw weighted sum arriving at that neuron is above that threshold, we're going to set the value of that output neuron to one. So the input neurons and the output neurons are only going to be able to encode binary values. We've got two binary input neurons, which means there's four possible cases. We can plug zero in here and zero in here and see what we get at the output. We can plug zero in here, one in here. We can see what we get at the output and so on. What I want you to do now is to write down in these boxes or on a, on a sheet of paper two synaptic weights. I want you to come up with weights for these two synapses. And I want you to come up with a third number, which is the threshold for the output neuron, so that if you label these two synapses with your two chosen weights and you embed this threshold in the output neuron's activation function, I want you to do it such that this neural network embodies this particular Boolean function. What is this Boolean function? And. And, yeah. So we're creating a neural network that embodies a particular function, the AND function. What are those two weights, and what should that activation threshold be? There is no one right answer. There are many triplets, two weights, and one activation threshold that'll do the trick. Uh, point 0.5 and point 0.5. Point 0.5 and point 0.5, OK. And then one for the threshold. OK. Can you tell us why you picked those three numbers? If I have that sum, then both are active. Absolutely. Great summary, right? So the trick to the AND function is having one active unit is insufficient, right? It's only when both input neurons are set to one that you want the output neuron to be one. So if we take, for simplicity's sake, 0.5, and we plug those two values in here, and we plug in 0, 0 at the input layer, 0 times 0.5 is 0, plus 0 times 0.5 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 is below 1, the activation function. So uh, 0, the raw sum, is below 1, the activation threshold. So the output neuron will output 0. So far, so good. If we plug in 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 times 0 0.5 is 0, 0 plus 1 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.5, 0 plus 0.5 is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, a raw weighted sum, is still below the activation function uh, threshold of 1, so the output neuron still outputs 0. It's only when we plug in 1, 1, 1 times 0.5 plus 1 times 0.5 is 1. 
oh, I've got a mistake here. We've got minus uh, less, less than or equal to. We now have the raw sum of 1, which is less than or equal to 1, which means the output is being set to 0 in this case. Not quite right. We need to make one slight change here to fix things. In the interest of time, I won't go back and do the original two cases. Let's do this case again. 1 times 0.5 plus 1 times 0.5 is 1, which is greater than 0.95. Thank you. Now that the raw sum is the raw sum of 1 is greater than 0.95, the output neuron outputs a 1. These three set of values assigned to this neural architecture cause this neural network to embody the AND function. So far, so good? OK. That's AND. Uh, you'll see my solution here pretty close to our solution. What about the OR function? Let's play the same game. What two synaptic weights plus an activation function applied to this same neural architecture will now cause this neural network to embody the OR function? Tell me about your intuition. How did you come up with these numbers? Um, because for OR, there's a pair of either of them, or both of them are on. So if either of them are on, we'll get a 1. If both of them are on, we'll get a 2, which is also a choice. Absolutely. So the values of the synaptic weights before were 0.5. Your solution is to increase the two weights of influence from 0.5 to 1, which means now either of these cases, if we plug in 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 times 1 is 0, plus 1 times 1 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, that 1 is already above our threshold. We now have a neural network that embodies the OR function. For some of you, this might seem silly and overly simplistic. If you've never done this before with pen and paper, I highly suggest you do so. For those of you lucky enough to go on and work in the AI industry and you build the next generation of fantastically complex and capable artificial neural networks, it behooves you to be able to, in the absence of everything else, sit down and manually simulate a neural network from the ground up. Yeah? Compared to tinkering with a fantastically complex machine, but not really having a good intuition for how that machine works at its most basic level. This is neural network operating in its bo most basic way. Yeah? OK. How about this one? Exclusive OR. We want to now, again, come up with two synaptic weights plus an activation threshold so that this neuron, uh, this neural network will output a 1 only if only one of its inputs is on. One negative one for the weights, and wait, uh, we need a threshold. You can use the same threshold. OK. Do these two Third synaptic time. weights plus no, that activation good. threshold, does it do the trick? Nope. Other ideas? A threshold of zero. A threshold of zero. Does that do it? In the interest of time, I won't go through all the four cases. Hopefully, you can do some of these in your head now. No, I wouldn't do it because if we were if you were adding both, then you would have um, you would have it. If you were adding the negative one, then it wouldn't be giving like a positive one value. It's not going to work. But okay. Other ideas? If you just have weights of one, one, and then have the threshold be anything greater than one. Anything greater than one? Yeah. Like two? 
A 1.5? Sorry, no, just one. One would be, so like, if it's 1.1, one, one, then the output's 2, which... So, so... Oh, wait, I guess... I'm, oh, wait, that doesn't game. work either. Yeah. Anyone figured out what the game b beneath the game is here? So you need three cases for your application? Uh, it's not going to do it. There is no set of three real values that will cause this neural network to embody the exclusive OR function. Okay, let's pause for a moment. This realization was made uh, in the, about around the mid 80s when neural networks were first starting to gain some traction. There was a AI high summer, or at least an AI spring that was in full bloom at that time. Most people were convinced, or a lot of people were convinced, holy cow, these things called artificial neural networks, this is it. We're finally going to make intelligent machines. These really smart guys back in 1956 told us that it would just take one summer. They were wrong. It took longer than we expected. But now, mid-80s, this is it. Here we go. Look, we can make a neural network that embodies OR. We can make a neural network that embodies AND. This is it. AGI is a breath away. If we can do AND and OR, we're almost there. Somebody came along. Marvin Minsky, who we actually talked about in the history of AI, came along and said, wait a second. There are actually some relatively simple functions that neural networks cannot solve. And that punctured, that ended up puncturing all of the excitement in AI within the AI community, more importantly, within the funding agencies that were giving money to drive this research. And that drove artificial neural networks into a very deep winter starting in the mid to late 1980s. In the 90s, if you mentioned artificial neural networks in a grant application, good luck to you. Some crazy person came along in the early 2000s, didn't call them artificial neural networks, called them deep learners. They rebranded what these things are called and showed that you could actually could create a now deep learner that solves the exclusive OR function Somebody mentioned adding one detail, which is maybe add a third case to the activation function. Turns out there are different ways you can add some complication to make these deep learners embody exclusive OR. That wasn't the twist they added. What was the twist they added in the early 2000s, which triggered the current high summer that we're in? Does anybody know? They made the networks deeper. If you think about each of these rows of neurons, and we're going to start to see neural networks arranged in rows of neurons, you could add layers in between. This is commonly known as the input layer. This is commonly known as the output layer. And the layer or layers sandwiched in between are known as the hidden layers. As long as those hidden layers also had certain kind of activation functions, and for our purposes, we'll just, we're just going to stick with the step function, you can get a now deep learner to embody exclusive OR. How? <laughs> As you can see here, I've added uh, a hidden layer. We've got two hidden neurons. so-called hidden neurons, because they're hidden from direct influence by the outside world. These neurons don't directly receive values from out here, whatever is upstream of the input layer. And they also do not directly influence whatever is outside here, downstream of the output neurons. All the hidden neurons do is influence or modulate the way that the layer before influences the layer of neurons after. So far, so good? OK. I've, I've solved half the problem for you. I've added two hidden neurons. I've wired up the two input neurons to the two hidden neurons with four synapses. And then we're going to take our two hidden neurons, wire them up with synapses to the one output neuron. And now, in order to get this thing, 
to embody the exclusive or we have to come up with one, two, three, four, five, six synaptic weights and one, two, three threshold activation thresholds for our two hidden neurons and our one output neuron. This is a pretty difficult problem to solve if you just attack it head on. I want you to pay attention to the strong hint that I'm giving you. The two hidden neurons, you're going to use them to compute partial results. And then those two partial results encoded in the two hidden neurons, I want you to come up with two synaptic weights and an activation threshold that combine those partial results in just the right way to solve exclusive OR. Before you start trying to come up with synaptic weights, what do you think the two, sub -resu two uh, partial results should be? What are the two subfunctions that make sense to compute and then combine them to solve exclusive OR? Is it AND and OR? AND and OR are the two subfunctions we want to create. Why is computing AND and OR first? and then combining them in some way, why is that a good way to solve exclusive OR? Exclusive OR is OR and not AND. OR and not AND, yeah. If we just look at the what we want the exclusive OR's outputs to be, I'm going to flick back and forth between exclusive OR and AND. Here's AND. Here's exclusive OR. Now I'm going to flip back and forth between exclusive OR and OR. In three out of the four cases, we want exclusive OR to act like OR, and only in the fourth case do we want to suppress or inhibit the OR function. Okay, so what do we need up here if we want this thing to embody AND and this thing to embody OR? Point 0.5 and point 0.5 and a threshold of uh, 0.95, which will give us which one? That will give us AND. So if we apply that to the left-hand hidden neuron, the left-hand hidden neuron will embody the AND function. We want the right-hand hidden neuron to embody the OR function. So it's 1, 1. Okay, what do we label the last two synapses with, and what activation thre threshold do we set? So for this, do we want to inhibit AND while keeping OR strong? Is that like, so yeah, negative there and a positive there. Why do we want to inhibit the AND gate? If, if AND is true, we want it to not act like the OR gate. Going back and forth between exclusive OR and OR, in only the case where 1 and 1 comes in, 1, 1 will light up the AND hidden neuron. That neuron, when it lights up, it should inhibit the output neuron. Everybody see that? Apologies, in my cartoon example here, I've got AND on the right-hand side and OR on the left-hand side. It doesn't matter. The intuition here is we want the neural network to compute AND and OR. As long as it's not 1-1, one, one, let this thing flow down to the output neuron. This thing should act like an OR gate in three out of the four cases. In just that case where 1-1 one, one happens, that 1-1 one, one should override this part and inhibit it so it outputs a zero. Um, so the activation threshold of the final neuron, that just has to be any positive number. Yeah, like, uh, does it just mean, or it's like, is Not any one, positive number. Or any like value between zero and one. Any value between zero and one. It, there's lots of different ways you could do this. And again, I encourage you, if you've got a free, few free moments this week, 
sit down with pen and paper and come up with different ways of doing this. Yeah? Okay. That's a lot of explanation just to really drive home this, this fact that choice of neural architecture, the number of neurons and synapses and how they're wired up, plus the labeling of that network, which synapses we set to excitatory and inhibitory and activation functions can alter this transformation. For our purposes, as we leave this slide, what we've done by introducing neurons is allow for nonlinear transformations. For our purposes, that just means that there are certain simple transformations that a shallow learner cannot do. There are more complex or nonlinear transformations for which you need a deep learner. You need something with one or more than one hidden layer. OK. Again, this is not a class in artificial neural networks, so I'm racing through a lot of these details. What happens if the, what happens if the neural network makes a mistake? We were able just barely to think up with our collective brains what all the weights and activation thresholds should be. Beyond exclusive or, it gets near impossible to actually write down the correct weights and activation functions for a neural network. So why don't we create a computer program that figures out what those weights and activation functions should be? There were many algorithms that pro were proposed to do this. The winning algorithm that came back with a vengeance in the early 2000s was the backpropagation of error algorithm. I just told you that the nuts and bolts of neurons and synapses and weights and activation thresholds is sort of the bread and butter of the deep learning revolution. It's really the bread. The butter is the other thing, the algorithm that is able to figure out what all these labelings should be. So deep, deep learners plus the backpropagation of error algorithm is what made ChatGPT and stable diffusion possible. OK, very briefly, how does backpropagation of error work? Let's imagine we have this particular neural network that has two output neurons, output one and output two. We have a big uh, truth table, or we've got not a big truth table, we've got four possible cases. And for whatever reason, when we supply zero, one here, we want the output to be one, zero doesn't matter which Boolean function this is. Let's just assume this is what we want to happen when this happens. Let's start by just setting all the weights to one. We don't know what they should be. Let's just all make them one. If we assign one and we feed in zero, one at the input layer, we do not get the desired result, one, zero. We get one, one. Output one did the right thing. Output one did the wrong thing. There's error at output two. There is no error at output one. What do we do next? The name of this algorithm gives it away, hopefully. Uh, we go back and adjust the weights based on the error that we have. We're going to propagate backwards through the network. We just propagated from input to output. Now we're going to back propagate from output up to input. And we're going to flow this error backwards and trace the origins of this error. Why did this neuron make a mistake? And we're not going to go into how this is actually done. It requires a little bit of calculus. We're not going to do that this morning. Suffice it to say, the backpropagation algorithm is able to determine how to change not the value of the neuron. It's going to go, keep going backwards. It's going to propagate backward. And it's going to make changes, in this case, to the two incoming synapses. These synapses, these two synapses, are the only thing that's influencing the behavior of this erroneous neuron. So that's where you should go. Backpropagation travels backwards along both links and makes a change to them. So that now, the next time you propagate forward, it does the right thing. That's the backpropagation uh, of error algorithm. Arguably the greatest invention ever human, any human ever invented. If someone were to ask for my opinion, I would say this is ultimately going to be more valuable than the wheel. You can form your own opinion. Okay. 
All right, one last thing I want to point out that will probably come up in your final project is a problem with the backpropagation of error algorithm, which is overfitting. Just as a cartoon example of how this works, you can see we've now made a more complicated truth table down here. It's still a binary table, but we've got more rows and columns now. We're going to assume that this is a clinical neural network. It's going to be used in the emergency room right across the quad over here. As patients arrive at the emergency room and complain, this particular patient one complains of symptom one, not symptom two. Yes, they complain of symptom K. A minute later, another patient walks through the ER doors. This particular patient is not suffering from symptom one or symptom two, but is suffering from symptom K. The ER continues to record all of this information. And whatever happens to that patient after their visit to the hospital, did they have a particular, were they eventually diagnosed with a particular disease or not? We're going to assume that with enough symptoms or tests, that there is an underlying relationship between all of these input values and the output we care about. Does the patient actually have the disease or not? Imagine we create a neural network with this kind of architecture where we have K input neurons for all the K possible symptoms that the ER uh, is recording. And we have one output neuron, which is the neural network's prediction about whether this particular patient with these symptoms is actually suffering from the disease or not. We're also going to assume that we don't know what this relationship is, but maybe it's complicated and nonlinear. So let's add in some hidden neurons down here and apply the backpropagation uh, of error algorithm. OK. Unbeknownst to us, what does this neural network do? During this backpropagation of error, where we feed in these different uh, patient symptoms, propagate forward, propagate backwards, tune the weights, feed in the next patient, propagate forward, propagate error back, tune the weights, tune, 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 over and over again with hundreds and hundreds of patient data. We see that this neural network actually gets better at reproducing what the doctors put a lot of effort into actually figuring out, which is whether or not the patient was suffering from that disease or not. Looks awesome. Our neural network is working. We take it, we give it to the nurses at ER, we tell the nurses, don't bother, don't bother the doctors. Just when somebody comes through the ER door, ask them, figure out what symptoms they're suffering from, plug that into the neural network, and if the neural network predicts they're not suffering from this disease, discharge them. There's no need to test them for the disease. This neural network knows whether or not these symptoms uh, are indicative of the disease or not. You can probably guess from this story where things are going. Okay, patient N plus one walks through the door and has a particular combination of symptoms that this neural network never saw. This neural network predicts that patient N plus one is not suffering from this infectious disease, so the nurse kicks them out of the ER room, uh, of ER unbeknownst to the neural network and the nurse and the patient this patient actually is suffering from that disease. The neural network made a mistake. Happens all the time. The most common explanation for why it's making this mistake is that the neural network has overfit. Let's assume we train this neural network on N patients. And just by coincidence, we happened to have N hidden neurons inside that neural network. There is an easy way for this neural network to learn and predict all of these N outcomes. Use hidden neuron one to memorize or recognize patient one. You can set all the incoming synapses to the first hidden neuron so that this hidden neuron will only light up when it sees patient one and the rest of the time it will stay silent. This second hidden neuron will learn through the backpropagation algorithm to light up only when it sees patient two and so on. It's memorizing all of the patients that are available during training. 
what do the, the weights of these synapses flowing from the hidden neurons to the output neuron do? How do you need to, if all the hidden neurons are memorizing the patient's symptoms, what do these synaptic weights need to do to allow this neural network to cheat, to predict correctly whether or not that patient is suffering from the disease? They need to establish weights that like the people who have the disease will always be signified as true. And if the patient is not suffering from the disease, we set the weight to? There will always be like some weight that will set it to be false. So for, for, the, for this particular patient one, they were suffering from the disease. So set this synaptic weight to one. One times one, if we set the activation threshold low, this output neuron will light up with a one. If patient two, we, who was not suffering from the disease, we feed in all of the symptoms of patient two, only the second neuron lights up, all the others stay silent. We take that lit up second hidden neuron and multiply it by a inhibitory weight. We get a negative value down here, which is very likely to be below the threshold, and this output neuron predicts, no, that patient is not suffering from the disease. I tell you that, surprise, surprise, we actually have a huge exam on Thursday. You haven't done any of the reading. You madly do all the reading. You try and contact students who've taken this class in previous years. You get the surprise exams from previous years. You don't have time to do all the reading and watch all the lectures. You memorize previous exams and hope, hope, hope that I recycle exams. We all panic from time to time and cheat by memorizing rather than learning patterns and data. Same thing with artificial neural networks. Okay, we got one minute left. How are we doing with time? We're not gonna finish this today. One additional detail I wanna uh, point out. Uh, we're gonna add one, uh, one final detail to our neural network architecture. We're gonna introduce what are known as recurrent connections or recurrent synapses. You might have no noticed that in all the cartoon neural networks we've looked at so far, they're all pointing more or less downward. They're pointing from the input layer towards the output layer in some way. We can also add recurrent connections where now, for example, if we're trying to compute the value at this first motor neuron, we can see that there are three incoming synapses to this particular motor neuron. So we're gonna take this value times this weight plus this value times this weight plus this value times this weight to compute this raw sum. If we know what this value should have been so that there's error at this particular, uh, there's error, oh sorry, let's forget error for a moment. We've computed the raw value at this point. We've taken this sensor value times this synapse, this sensor value times this synapse. We need to collect the value from motor two, but we haven't computed the value of motor two yet. We're just on motor one. We're going to take the, val the value of motor two from the previous time step. If, we if we'd already updated this neural network once, we have a value for motor two from the previous time step. <coughs> So we're combining at this particular neuron sensation in the current time step, what it's currently sensing, and a memory of what motor two did a short moment ago. So the last thing I wanna leave you with today is if we add recurrent synapses to our neural network, we add memory to a neural network, which we're gonna see is useful for certain robots that need to combine current sensation with a memory of things that have happened in the past to know exactly what to do in the current moment. Undergrads, you're working on assignment three. Grads, you're working on five and six. You have a quiz due tonight. I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you.